This film is not suitable for children. It contains verbal descriptions of extreme cruelty, including ritualistic abuse, body mutilation, child pornography, and incest. I think it was a man and a lot of men was in the same shirt. I think it was my dad! I think it was my dad! <laughs> abused when I was a kid. If someone had asked me that before I was 37 years old, I would have said no. Mary Knight was a social worker herself, and she's telling her story to try and break the abuse cycle for others. Oh, we have a family of deer that started living here before we did. And Beautiful surroundings. The one thing her life now and her life then have in common. My sister and I would go just exploring through the woods and that was kind of our getaway. Otherwise, this Oregon City filmmaker's early life was something out of a horror film. I had an extremely abusive childhood. I was prostituted as a child. Uh, my parents produced child pornography and used me as um, in it. Mary and I didn't even remember that abuse until she was in her 30s. First reaction to finding out I was doing this project? I thought, who the heck is she that would do <laughs> something like this? Um, did it make you not trust me? It did. Because I thought, well, what if you were going to, what if you'd already made your decision that what you'd recovered were false memories? So I thought you were a false memory person, and I was very, very careful about you. Just in simple terms, what do you think recovered memory is? Uh, recovered memory is a child undergoes trauma. They're at risk if they tell anyone. So they must find a way to forget it. So they do. And they forget it until the time is safe for them to recall it. Who is Dr. Elizabeth Loftus? Well, she's always introduced by the media as a world-renowned memory researcher. She's a professor of psych cognitive psychology. She's also associated with the law department at uh, UC Irvine. These claims about repression um, are claims that uh, you know, horrible brutalization is banished into the unconscious by some process that's beyond ordinary forgetting and remembering. And then, you know, years later, you, according to the theory, go through some kind of therapy that uh, lifts this veil of repression and makes you aware of the experiences. And it, it's that kind of claim that I just haven't seen any real credible scientific support for. Uh -huh. It's a kind of a strange experience for me because, you know, often it, the individuals who, th who think they were abused or think they have repressed memories of abuse, um, they don't particularly want to talk to me. Uh-huh. And, and I, they don't want to have their memories questioned. And they are typically, you know, angry at people. This is a new experience. Uh, yeah, for both of us. For, yeah. Yeah, for, yeah. yeah, for both of us. If I'm willing to do a documentary entitled, Am I Crazy? my journey to determine if my memories are true, then one thing I have to do is truly question my memories. I have to commit to myself, I'm gonna question it. And to me, the best way to do it is to talk to people who don't believe memories like mine exist. I don't know anything about your situation. I, I'm a survivor of extreme abuse, of ritualistic abuse. Ritualistic child abuse may include desecration of something sacred, group settings, torture. Ritualistic abusers sometimes hide their crimes within cults, churches, child pornography networks, and other organizations. I was molested by a number of um, family member and non-family members. 
and you know, I, I told you I made, I made cookies for you with my mom's recipe, but um, she, she sexually abused me. Your mother. So how old w were you? Um, it was through a long period of my childhood. But like what to what? I mean, starting what age? Young to um, through teenage years. Yeah, so it was for a long time, yeah. And then what happened? Um, then I, uh, my, um, I had relatives who remembered and I went to counseling and um, I remembered. So then how old were you, but roughly then? About 37. Hmm. Yeah. And how do you, know it really happened. The real reason I know is that I just have a really spiritual connection and I, that's just what I know to be true in my deepest self. But then also I do have five relatives with similar memories. Right. I had hoped they would be interviewed for the documentary. It looks like none of them will be, but I'm still hopeful about one. But. Um, Really, in a way, it's okay that they don't because most survivors don't have that kind of external corroboration. And I've, I want this documentary to say to survivors, you're okay, and you don't need something external because, I mean, that's really part of the abuse was that your thoughts and your feelings and your perceptions are not enough. And so then, if in therapy or in recovery we say, well, you need external corroboration, what, is that, what message is that? My cousin Lisa. If you say something you don't want to use, that's, I'm just so glad you're willing to do it at all. And really, the first thing, I mean, the answer to this question, um, I mean, basically, you're, you're my cousin. Yes, we're cousins. <laughs> So I'm wondering if we have memories in common and I was, I was raped by our grandfather. Do you have a memory like that? Yes. Yes, I do. I believe uh, we came from a family that engaged in generational abuse and um, that I was abused by multiple family members. My father, do you think he was my father abused me, my father abused me by being, uh, allowed me to abuse, be abused by other people. Yes. Did that happen yes. to you? Yes. I mean, he was, he was not someone who physically touched me, but almost coaching others. Somehow taking pictures as well. So this would be child pornography? I have no idea what he was doing with what he was taking, but um, yes. Yes. Encouraging others to be involved in sexual acts with me and filming them, so, yeah. Okay, that definitely happened to me. Lisa allowed me to use her exact words, but her voice was replaced by that of an actor. So now I, I basically, I have five minutes of your story and yeah. your, well, I, I don't, I, I hope this won't be offensive, but your, your claims about what other people said, but I haven't heard those claims from them. And so I don't know, so I can't be sure if, if when you tell me and, you know, and I have an aunt and she says she was abused or, you know, did the aunt really say that? And did the aunt really mean that? And, or did the aunt really mean something else like emotional abuse rather than sexual or ritual abuse? Um, mm -hmm. So without having so little data, it's really hard for me to mm -hmm. know what to, to think. But if they did say that, I mean, I, I know that they did. Yeah. You know, I mean, you don't know it, I understand that, but I know that they did. So you're asking, like, why do I believe it? Well, that's one of the reasons. Mm -hmm. And so then after I would remember something, I'd call one of them, and they'd, you know, have a similar memory to a lot of my memories. Your investigation about your memories was all on camera and you did not know how it was going to turn out. Yeah, you know, I think that's why I did it. I really now think 
that I did it because I knew I needed to challenge myself that much. And now I realize I did this project as my way to confront my parents who are deceased. It was my way to sit across from my parents and say, why, why did you do what you did? And why aren't you now treating me good? I traveled to Florida to interview Eleanor Goldstein, the author of three books disputing recovered memories. My husband Jerry came with me as my camera person. Eleanor is about the same age my mother would have been. She invited us to stay with her and I thought about doing it. Instead, we went to the hotel and figured out how to use sound equipment. So why don't you tell me how beautiful I am or something so I can see how the cameraman sounds in it. Don't push your luck. Okay, that's a wonderful response. Confabulation is a mixture of fact and fantasy to create a new memory. Mm -hmm. We do that every day. We, mm -hmm. we mix our memories up with other people's memories. Mm -hmm. So we've learned that memory is very, very fl uh, pliable. And you can get people to believe anything that you want them to believe if you use the right techniques. Mm -hmm. How did you get your memories back? Did you get it back spontaneously? Did you get it back with the aid of a therapist who used some suggestibility? That was my greatest fear in going was, oh, I was like, they'll ask me some question that I'd never thought of before. And then I'll go, maybe my memories aren't true. I'm, the questions they asked, I'd already asked myself. I was an investigator when I remembered my abuse. I'd been, um, I had been, well, I'd done, at that point, two or 300 custody evaluations. I placed 100 kids in adoptive homes. And you always, of course, you investigate those homes very carefully. And I know how to do investigations. And so then, when I remembered my, my own abuse, I treated it like, I mean, I could let myself just go, if I were the investigator on this case, what questions would I ask? And I asked myself all those questions. I was seeing a counselor and I did have, I had five hypnosis sessions. I have, I don't have those with me, but I have, uh, well, actually I have the- Then how do you know for sure that these memories are true if you had five hypnosis sessions? I asked for hypnotherapy and okay. I asked for it because I had young kids and I had reasons to suspect relatives. And I needed to know. I needed to know who, I, who to protect my kids from. Oh, sure. I transcribed the hypnosis tapes, but listening to those and transcribing them, that was an excellent psychologist. <laughs> she did not ask any leading questions. I think that survivors, and I tried to do this, like I didn't, I wouldn't go on antidepressants for a long time because it's like, oh, my parents are more likely to believe my memories are true and then they'll go get treatment if I don't, you know, do anything wrong. No. That's not why they don't believe you. No, it's not why. Like, why do you believe me? Because I know you. When did you start believing me? Several months after I met you. And what made the difference? I didn't disbelieve you in the beginning. I just had to get to know you better. What made the difference with believing me? Nothing in particular. I just got to know you. Bullshit memories that come back like that out of the blue. I, would, I spoke in Canada at, at um, Simon Fraser University, dentist. And all of a sudden, 20 years later, some patient comes and says, I remember 20 years ago you abused me when I was in the dental chair, but I forgot about it until I went to therapy. Now I remember. I was wondering why you interviewed her. She's, I know she's written a couple of books that I've read. She's written I, I three read. books. She's written three books, but she's not a memory expert. No, she's, she's not. not. You know, she's not a mental health expert. But I interviewed her because I was told that there was someone who had firsthand information that Marilyn's memories were not true. And now, Miss America of 1958. From Atlantic City, New Jersey. It would not be possible to know or understand me unless you knew about the unending sexual violations I endured as a child and as a teenager. The trauma was so severe, I did what many children do in order to survive. I split 
or to use the psychiatric word, I dissociated. I split into what I call a day child and a night child. As difficult as this is for most people to believe or understand, until I was 24, I, the day child, had no conscious knowledge of the night child. All I'm saying is I knew this very beautiful, intact, happy, go And how well did woman. you know her? Well, not very well, except that I was in a class with her every single day. But I had been told that she had first-hand information that Marilyn's memories weren't true. And so I had questions like, um, I had questions for like, well, tell me about the time she confided in you. They took a class together in college. She has no other information about her. Did she tell you that Marilyn's memories were false? Or was that? Yeah. Oh, she did. Well, she told me that they were very, you know, that questionable. Questionable. She will allow me to use some footage. What footage? Of Marilyn? Uh, from a talk she gave. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, I don't because know. Because she doesn't want to be confronted. She has a, a, she has a prepared speech, and uh -huh. that's what she's willing to acknowledge, but she doesn't want to be confronted, apparently. Oh, I really get to talk to her. I'm nervous and excited. Hello. Hi, Marilyn. It's Mary Knight. It's nice to hear your voice. It's good to hear your voice. I am, oh, I just, I just have so much respect for you. I remembered in my abuse in 93, and it was in, uh, like a year later, my counselor gave me this video of a presentation you did. And so I took it home, I was sitting in my living room listening to your presentation, and of course when you say, you know, if you're comfortable, if you're a survivor and you're comfortable standing, you may do so now. I stood up in my living room. Oh, I love that. <laughs> and I, I thought, you know, someday I want to do what Marilyn's doing for incest survivors, I want to do for survivors of ritual abuse. So, and that's what you're doing. It is. I ask survivors to stand for several reasons. One is because I'm always hoping there are some of you here today who are as empowered as I finally am. It took me 53 years to get rid of shame, but I don't have an ounce of shame today. I'm so very proud of who I am. And I hope that there are others of you here today who have also worked through the shame. Do you think survivors need to go public in order to heal from the shame? Oh, I do not. No, I think each of us is on a different journey. Um, some people are, will stand publicly without shame. As long as survivors work through the shame, if the reason they don't stand is because of shame, then that's a problem for me. Did you know Eleanor Goldstein in college? I did not know Eleanor Goldstein in college. I wanted to go back to school. I wanted to go back to college. And people would say to me, do you really think you can go back and just be a junior in college? That wasn't the problem. The problem was how people reacted to me. I went to the football game and people were lining up for my autograph. The Miss America pageant Atlantic City, New Jersey, let's join Miss Colorado, Marilyn Van Derber at the Hammond organ. At that time, Miss America was very, very highly regarded. I am old, so I can remember when the Miss America pageant was the most popular TV show. That was You're before. old. Yeah, yeah, that was before the Super Bowl. What about um, the former Miss America, Marilyn Vandebeer? She went through a tremendous amount of all kinds of different therapy before, highly suggestive therapy before she told the story of abuse. So how, that's not what it was reported in People magazine. Did, is there some other way you have yeah, oh, information? I've, I've watched lectures that she's given. And, and in lectures she said what? She's talked about the massive amount of therapy. But that was not, that was after remembering. I'm not sure of that, no. What she, yeah, she has said publicly that she remembered, I mean, it's, 
Well, I have the People magazine here. Uh, yeah, article. but I, I've read a whole bunch more than just People magazine about that case. It's a, it's, it's a very suspicious case. And tell me more why you said I just, that. I just believe that uh, she had lots and lots of, uh, of different kinds of therapy, and so we can't know whether what, what she ultimately came up with is an actual memory or is a, is a product of suggestive therapy. We just don't know. How old were you when you first had therapy? Uh, my memory came up when I was 24. I did not start therapy until I was 39. You think she's not telling the truth? I, I don't. I, I don't know, but I've heard about a whole bunch of other therapy and afterwards. No, I'm not sure of that. I'm not sure of that. So you think? So your concern is what therapy she had before 1960? I, I, I just don't know that those memories are real. Uh huh. And then her sister, of course always remembered sexual abuse. Well, we don't know father. exactly what her sister remembered, though. I've never read exactly, you know, what the sister remembered. The sister su supposedly um, felt there was some kind of abuse, but I don't know what it is. Sexual abuse. That the sister was remembering, so I just don't know. So that could be a corroborated case if the sister has continuous memory of the memory that Marilyn has. Well, I don't know that, yeah, well, we'd have to know a whole lot more. When, uh -huh. And I just, I only, I, I only get to know in depth about the cases that I work on. And, and uh -huh. the, you know, the rest of them, it's kind of newspaper knowledge. So I had a press conference, and the next day it was on the page, front page of the Rocky Mountain News and the Denver Post. I got a phone call. <clears throat> They're calling your sisters. I called my sister Gwen in San Francisco, and I said, if you want to go public with this, do it in California because we're never gonna get off the front pages in Denver. The next morning, the third day, it was on the front page of the paper again with my sister's story and my picture. I waited until our daughter awakened. She had just come home from her sophomore year in college. She woke up and I said to Larry and Jennifer, I have to get out of here, I have to go. So we put on our sweats and we went to the high school track. We were jogging around the track and the woman with her two dogs came. We always said hello, she stopped me. And she said, Marilyn, we're so proud of what you're doing. And I'm so grateful your sister came forward this morning. I had been upset about that. And I said, really, why? And she said, because yesterday, on our most popular radio talk show, people were calling in and saying, why should we believe her? Now that your sister has come forward, they will have to believe you. I was stunned. I looked at her and I said, if people are not going to believe 53-year-old me, then who is going to believe a child? Why didn't you tell anyone about the abuse? I, I mean, I get asked, like, well, why didn't you tell someone when you were a child? I know, I did tell someone when I was about six. Who did you tell? Who, who was it? I don't remember, but the story got back to one of my two parents, and they realized that they would have to do something to silence me. Dad made me, he, he made me do something. He made me eat something that I thought was poisonous, and I thought he would, I thought he was killing me. I thought my father was killing me. And... Your father's a physician, right? Yeah, he so is. So he would know whether or not that would kill you? Yeah, he would. But at age six? I didn't know. You thought it was going to kill you? I did. And I was awfully surprised to wake up in the morning because I thought I was going to die, but I woke up. But I was unsure that I thought I might die the next day. It took me a couple of days before I realized that I was going to live. Yeah. And it did silence you, and was that when you started, was, what, was that when you started hiding those, that knowledge of it from yourself? Yeah, that is because I could never talk about it again. I could never yeah. think about it. So anytime I thought about it, I would have to push it away. I mm -hmm. would just say, forget it. Mm -hmm. Have you read this book? No, I haven't. I recommend it. Okay. It's good. It talks about the connection between mind and body. Okay. And yeah, I've I, heard good things about it. Yeah, yeah, I'd heard things about it, and then I read it, 
And I thought, this is who I want to interview. And then I found out he was doing a conference in Portland. What does it mean, the body keeps score? We are our bodies. Our head is only one seventh of our whole organism and our frontal lobe where we have any thoughts is only one quarter of that. The function of the brain is to take care of the body. And so when you get traumatized, everything in your survival brain, which is like about half of your brain, gets set to be worried about survival. And that's all expressed in bodily sensations. And then the next part of your brain is involved in creating a map of the world. Mm -hmm. And so um, as your brain forms, you don't know anything about what's going out there. And that part of the brain, which you call the limbic system, you can call it any number of things, um, it creates a map of what's going on out there and how I do react to. And it tells you what is safe, what's dangerous, who am I in relationship to my surroundings, where do I go to get the good stuff, what do I avoid to get the bad stuff. And so that is a hardwired map of your brain. Your early experiences determine that map of your brain. So if people beat you up and tell you that you're a rotten kid, that map of the world is, I'm a rotten person, I'm a terrible person, and the world is an unsafe place. Extremely difficult to change. These are hardwired parts of the brain. And our job of my profession is to find out how we can rewire these very primitive maps. And so at the very core of trauma is the whole notion that our brain scan showed it is the uh, the verbal language center of the brain gets knocked out when people become extremely upset. From the very first moment I started to see traumatized people, the issue of people not remembering or just seeing images, just having feelings, was very prominent. I, I wrote about it the moment I started to write about Vietnam veterans, that these memories were really very different from the memories of the movie you saw yesterday. Um, and that's what's really fascinating, is that um, the language center of the brain shuts down, all that memory stuff becomes complicated, and, um, and that memory of trauma is different. And what became very clear is that if you're not allowed to talk about the trauma, or you're not allowed to help for people to help to make sense out of being dumbfounded, or as Shakespeare says, struck with speechless terror, then the memory sort of goes away, but your body keeps reacting because your body knows in some ways. And that was really the very first thing that got me interested in trauma is that I wrote a whole bunch of case histories of people who were in the Coconut Club fire in 1943 who couldn't remember what happened, but on the anniversary of the fire, they would run out in the streets and scream fire, fire, and try to hurt people together. And Vietnam veterans would reenact their trauma, but wouldn't remember what happened. There were a few things that I have always remembered that I think were not right. I remember my dad saying that he was sexually attracted to me. Hmm. I think that's... How old were you when he said that? You know, I don't think it matters how old someone is. It's no, just wrong. I mean, you can say, oh, yeah. You know, some things you just take as a, as a joke. People say stupid things. That's not something I think a father would usually joke about, well, that he's sexually attracted to his daughter. What did you say? How old were you? You don't remember? Yeah, I do. I remember I was about 13. You sent that email and said, this is Eleanor's daughter, a survivor. Uh, and she's a survivor. I'm yeah. like, wow. I think it's pretty courageous of her after so many years oh, I to know. go public. So you're sure you're a survivor of abuse? Oh, yeah. As sure as I can be without having, you know, footage of it. Yes. And I have to trust that. Otherwise, where does it leave me? Do you remember actually telling your parents about it? Yeah, because I didn't know they had anything to do with it. Uh -huh. The first memory that came up, I just remembered babysitters. How did your interest in the subject begin? So I was doing all this research, and my uh, function was to find out information. And I was sitting at my desk one day, and there was an article, and it said, parents claim to be falsely accused. So that was a lie. But absolutely, the deeper truth is that she had a daughter, who me, who was having memories. 
we have to help each other and forgive and understand and have empathy and not carry grudges forever and ever, generational, one generation after the other. Hates, 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 he touched me. Oh my God, he touched me. And therefore he touched me and he's dead. He's dead. And so even if again. there was the incestuous touch, you think the family should I don't still know what together. incestuous the touch is. I well, mean, in a court, if somebody you know. comes into your bedroom and forces himself on you, that's one thing. If he, if he, what if, what if what? I had an uncle, my sister says, used to uh, fondle her. He'd hold a newspaper like this and he'd fondle her. Okay, he's dead. Don't ever speak to him again, he's dead. He made a terrible mistake. So story. even fondling, you think, Say, get out of here, Uncle Irving, leave me alone, and walk so away. So you think the little kid should be responsible for you? I think in a certain point, if he's uncomfortable, they should speak up for themselves and be responsible for themselves, not carry a grudge from century to century. But if there was sexual touch, do you think the family should still stay together? Of course. Even if there was Absolutely, <laughs> yes. I don't think that, I don't think sexual touch is the horror of all horrors. I don't think so. I think we make a big to-do about nothing. How did the child sexual abuse affect you? I don't know. I mean, I'm, 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 I don't pin anything on it. You don't know of any way it affected you? I don't, <laughs> nope. At age six, she was fondled. I read you told you were afraid you were pregnant. That's just because I didn't know. I didn't, uh -huh. I didn't, I was like naive and, Oh, did you not know how sex? No, I didn't know. Oh, so you so I just thought maybe you know he left some sperm somewhere and or, you know or whatever, and maybe it, then when you turn thirteen, that's when it kicks in and makes uh, you pregnant. Oh, yeah. She testified for my father in the lawsuit in which I sued my parents and won. Daughter wins sex abuse case against parents. The judge believed me. And the case was corroborated. Well, I had a sister who always remembered, and I had a father who said, it's not sexual abuse if a father makes his daughter touch his penis. Well, actually it is, it's a crime. Yeah, and he, he said that in a deposition. Yeah, right? he did. In the case, Lynn Crook, the part that McNally includes is that she testified that her father said, keep your legs together, but, the full quote is, keep your legs together or I'll think you want me, which is, I consider, extremely inappropriate. But he only quoted that first part of it, making it seem like there was no evidence. But, you know, if a father really does say that to a daughter, to me that is evidence that he is not appropriate sexually. Well, I don't know whether it means he did anything, but as far as the accusations of Lynn Crook, I think they're extremely dubious. How do you feel about Dr. Loftus? Oh, I think that, um, I think she designed a defense for people who were facing civil charges. They needed a defense back in 1991. She discovered one. She created it for them, she created the research to back it up, and that's where she is, and she gets paid a ton of money to do it. And no one fact checks anything she says. Yeah, yeah. And she's very, very good with the media. Do you ever get mad at her? Oh, I think I used to, especially after she falsified my case to the media. Yeah. Yeah, that, that shocked yeah. me. After you take your case to court and you Talk, say all this personal stuff about yourself. You win the case and someone lies about your case to the media. I mean, that's just, it's just dumb. Yeah. Really, she thought she could do that to me. Yeah. And so I, that's why I filed the ethics complaint. Really, you can't do that. Dr. Loftus resigned from the American Psychological Association one month after Lynn Crook filed an ethics complaint against her. I mean, you can't. You can't yeah, do that. you can't lie. You can't lie. Yeah. You tell about a study you did of 105 women in drug treatment that about 50 percent were sexually abused. Um, that was a study of women who were in outpatient treatment for substance abuse, and it was being done by a psychiatrist. So I talked her into putting some memory questions into her survey mm -hmm. with these women. We asked them to tell us, you know, the status of their memory. Would would they? Which of these statements is closest to you? 
I always remembered, even if I didn't talk about it, uh, I remembered parts of the abuse, but maybe not all of it. Uh, I forgot for a period of time, and then, then the memory came back. And there were like 9% who It was forgot. something like eight, 17 or 18 percent, depending on whether oh, you uh -huh. count missing data or not, oh, uh -huh. who said, I forgot for a period of time, and then the memory came back. Um, but we don't know what, you know, in the end, we don't know what they meant by that. You know, I'm sure there's plenty of genuine abuse right. and abuse by right. priests and people who yeah. don't think about it for a long time and then then get reminded of it. And What so, about Ross Chite? Do you know about, I mean, he says that he... Um, I don't know that he would say he repressed his memory. Yes. Dr. Ross Chite lists 110 corroborated recovered memory cases on his website. His own case is number 26. I mean, because he does, he seems to have found corroboration, some okay. corroboration, okay. But, it do, but we don't know that he repressed it. Dr. Ross Chite is an attorney, author, and Brown University professor. He calls his website Recovered Memory Archives. I think in general, people who are abused as children either heal from it or they use that, ex or that experience propels them to hurt other people. And with Dr. Loftus, what I think the most reasonable explanation for an intelligent woman ignoring not only the neuroscientific research that's out now, but her own survey study that showed that 18 percent um, of people of child sexual abuse survivors ha in the study had delayed recall. The explanation I can find is she was affected by her own childhood hurt. And unlike my parents, she doesn't hurt children, but she has made life hell for a lot of survivors of childhood sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. Dr. Loftus has testified on behalf of hundreds of accused parents. She was hired as a consultant by Bill Cosby's defense team. Dr. Loftus testified for Ghislaine Maxwell, Harvey Weinstein, Michael Jackson, Ted Bundy. I'm not interested in Dr. Loftus and her research. I'm a trauma specialist. She's a laboratory specialist who looked, shows people's movies about what they just saw that has no emotional valence. She doesn't inform the work of child abuse, priest abuse, and childhood trauma, because that's not her area of expertise. So as a scientist, the only people whose work is interesting to me are people who can clarify how people process the memory of extreme experiences. She happens to be not one of them. So you cannot study people being raped in a laboratory because we cannot rape people in a laboratory. So we're really talking about apples and oranges. Mm -hmm. And it's boring to talk about orange growth when people, other people talk about apples. A whole group of people studied the British Army after the evacuation of Dunkirk in 1940, and they find one, that one third of the people block out their memories and are in a daze, and they write it up in medical journals. And that is like, everybody knows that. And then when incest survivors say, this happened to me too, People say, no, it happens to soldiers, but it doesn't happen to you. Do you think that the people just don't want to look at something that bad as incest? Oh, no, it's, it's not that. It's that certain people don't want to look at that. The army didn't want to look at the memory loss in the First World War. And so in 1917, on July, June 16th, the British general staff says, you're not allowed to use the word shell shock anymore because it will undermine the morale of the war and people will no longer want to fight. So if it's not politically convenient, people are not allowed to talk about it. And so it's fine for incest victims to talk about the trauma as long as I'm not the perpetrator of the incest. In 1991, People magazine did three cover stories on recovered memory. By then, you had 24 states had allowed victims to sue on, based on recovered memories. It was, there were, there were th probably thousands of people in, in the U.S. who were concerned about a defense for these lawsuits. And so Loftus was out there tossing out ideas to the media. Was this, 
were these uh, sexual fantasies. Uh, daughters were dreaming about fantasizing about their husbands. Their about, fathers. About their fathers, <laughs> about their fathers. What were all these, um, what were all these things about? Certainly they couldn't be about sexual abuse. So finally she came up with a story well, it must be a therapist implanting, suggesting ideas to their clients. And that became the defense. It first made a headline in August 1991 in the Washington Post. That became their defense. Before then, they had nothing. No, they love people who ha have a real serious stake in the science of what's going on here. They're an advocacy group mm -hmm. for people who, for reasons of their own, Mm -hmm. You figure out what it is. Need to deny that incest is real. They have a problem. I was a speaker at the Virtual Global Summit to End Sexual Exploitation. That's how I met fellow speaker and fellow child abuse survivor, Crystal Denise Garcia. Crystal, it's great to see you. You are such a good pandemic friend. Oh, yes, I love our friendship and I can't wait to meet up someday. Me too. Something you and I have in common is recovered memories of child abuse. Please tell about yours. Yeah, so the first recovered memory I had was when I was pregnant. I got my recovered memory from of child abuse, and I never knew that I, I had been abused. I, I had parts of my life that were blacked out, but I thought it was just maybe I was too young to remember it. I realized that it was blacked out because of trauma. And so when I was pregnant, that recovered memory came back. I had no clue that, that I had suffered that. And when I told the, the nurse, she said, oh yeah, that's normal. That happens to pregnant women all the time. I recently uncovered another, an, another memory and it was from even earlier uh, in, in, my, in my childhood. And that was very intense. It was very intense. I, I could barely get through it. And so I went seeking support. I went to a therapist and I told her what happened. I told her what I was dealing with. I told her what I was trying to work through that was very, very difficult for me. And she said, okay, well, maybe that happened, but who can verify that for you? And I was just really blown away because I was like, what do you mean maybe it happened? I just told you it happened. And why are you seeking verification outside of me when I'm here in front of you telling you, why is someone else's voice more valid than mine? So I felt shut down. I felt degraded. And who would I verify that with? Who would I verify my personal experiences that I survived with? And I, I, it's not like I would have anyone to ask for verification. And I mean, it's, I was in such dangerous situations as a child, but I ended up in foster care. I am so sorry that happened to you. There's actually an organization that recommends counselors do just what your counselor did. That's that's horrifying. I don't even understand why an organization like that would, would exist. It's called the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. Wow. Just the name alone is is pretty cringy. I mean, that's pretty disturbing. I mean, it's that sounds like just complete gaslighting, you know, just shutting survivors down. That's disturbing. it's made up of it's made up of parents, accused parents, people who oh own children consider them rapists. Wow. And nobody has a problem with this. They don't realize that the people who are being like, who who are being said that they are predators are now running an organization to say that they're not. <laughs> that's, that's a good that's point. That's really alarming. It was started by the parents of Dr. Jennifer Fry just a year after she recovered memories of incest by her father. Dr. Jennifer Fry is a researcher, professor, author, and expert on the psychology of sexual trauma. She wrote a book on betrayal trauma theory stating that if children are sexually abused by a caregiver, they might forget the abuse in order to maintain the relationship with the person they depend on for survival. It makes sense. 
Humans have a very well-developed attachment system. The attachment system works in both the dependent person and in the caregiver. We've got a, a reciprocal relationship in the sense that both the caregiver and the um, infant are giving each other reinforcement for this relationship. And the infant has to do that because this is an extremely resource expensive relationship for the caregiver. So imagine that baby detecting some mistreatment and trying to respond in the way an empowered person would, that baby's probably risking his or her life because the caregiver might withdraw. The first interview for this film was in Philadelphia. It was with Dr. Jennifer Fried's mother, Pam Fried. I was so nervous. Meeting the founder of the False Memory Syndrome Foundation was my first step in an on-camera confrontation with the deepest and most vulnerable part of myself. Hi. Hey. Something's gotten you questioning, and you really are. Yeah. Very, very I really. Uh, yeah. Carefully. Yeah. I think and I admirable. appreciate. Oh, thank you. I just was really surprised. I pick up the phone and call and. I didn't expect to actually, you answer your phone and then I'm like, can I come? And you're like, that's okay. And I mean, it's the name I've always associated with, you know, False Memory Syndrome Foundation. Um, you and your husband are founders, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. When I decided to do this, the film Am I Crazy, um, I decided to really, truly, honestly explore could my memories not be true? And as you know, I mean, I've had them, um, it was, it's been 20 or 21 years that, since I remembered. So, uh, but I wanted to talk to the best people about it. And I, I thought, yeah, that's you and then whoever you recommend. I have another question. Yes. Your aunt. Was it yes. your, your uh, aunt? My father's sister. Did say some things that sowed some really serious doubts and great concerns. Yes. And you wanted to be sure your children were safe. Oh, absolutely. Right. I didn't want to break contact unnecessarily, but I didn't want my children to be at risk. Your aunt seems to have been influential in your life. She seems to have played a really strong role in your beliefs. No, I mean, I just didn't know her. I just hadn't been around her for, you know, some time. My father's sister hadn't wanted to see him for years. And I didn't know why. And she lived not far from where I lived. And I mean, I lived in the Dallas, Texas area. And so my parents came to see me and they saw my aunt on that same visit. And I said, well, what did she say? You know, because I mean, she hadn't talked to you for years. What's going on? They told me that she thought she was abused. And I said, well, what are you going to do? You know, she, well, we just won't see her anymore. And I said, well, you mean you're just never going to see her again? Oh, yeah, she's, she's crazy. We won't see her anymore. They both said that. And then I called my aunt, and I said, would you meet with me? And she said, yes, I will. I had the sense it was true, and I, I didn't have any memories, but I went to a counselor at that point. So what happened after you? You recovered these memories and... Well, my first memory was just, it didn't come under hypnosis. It was a flashback as I was, um, my counselor had me write down what I do remember, what, anything I do remember from my childhood, just anything, no matter how benign. And during that period of time, I remembered I had this flash. I had a flash of a man grabbing a dog gruffly. And so then I had my first hypnosis. And under hypnosis, um, she wanted to go up the sleeve to um, see who the man was. And that tape is still gut-wrenching for me to hear because it's just like, I just was sobbing because it was my dad. I called my dad at that point. I called him at work because I thought if I talked to him directly, he would get into counseling too. And then we could both determine what was going on here. And um, I could still have a relationship with my parents. 
So I called him and he said, I have a very good memory and I know that didn't happen. And um, he said, I, I suppose we won't have any contact with you anymore. I said, well, I, I never said that. I, it's not my intent of the phone call. I did tell him my children wouldn't be visiting that summer. Um, but I never said that I wouldn't have contact with him. And he, uh, he said, is this gonna lead you to believe that you were sexually abused by me? I said, well, I, I don't think so, you know, I mean, I, so anyway, that, that, um, that was the change in my relationship with my parents. And this was all in Texas? I lived in Texas and they lived in Denver. What was the year? I think it was 1992. Tell about when did your organization start? And we started in 1992. There were a bunch of families that got together. We were one of them because, um, uh, our daughter recovered memories, and um, that was how the foundation started. We were trying to figure out uh, what was going on, and we found other families, and we found some professionals. And now, Dr. Un Underwager, Underwager, mm -hmm. whatever, um, was, who, was he one of the professionals that helped with it? He was one of the first people we called. He helped, um, you know, he had taken a phone number so that people could call to request information. Um, this was before the foundation was actually formed. So did he give you some phone numbers he had or something? Well, he had been doing that all along. And he said he would speak with families. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, we had contact with him. When we first formed the foundation, we thought he might be uh, good to be on the advisory board. We had no idea whatsoever about um, the interview he's had in the Netherlands. Pydeka describes itself as a pro-pedophile publication. In a 1991 interview, Dr. Underwager was asked, is choosing pedophilia a responsible choice? He replied, certainly it is responsible. Pedophiles can boldly and courageously affirm what they choose. They can say, I believe this is in fact part of God's will. That really has nothing to do with recovered memories. That has to do with some opinions on... On pedophilia. On child abuse, uh, yeah, pedophilia. On pedophilia. And whether it's child abuse. But was, isn't Dr. Wakefield still on your board? Or she was quoted in She's that still too. on the board. Well, she, she was... She was in the interview too. They wrote papers together, they wrote a book together, and she's asked, doesn't your book, Accusations of Child Sexual Abuse, suggest that all sexual relationships between adults and children in the United States are abusive relationships? And she says, no. She said something like, there should, that the only way we could know if pedophilia was harmful is to do research with, um, you know, with children like nine, was, 10, 11 year old children was, uh, and seeing how, how a long-term loving relationship, sexual relationship between them and an adult would affect them, if I understood that, right? Did I understand that wrong? I would have to go and check the years that she's talking about, but she was uh, talking about another country. Wakefield said, it would be nice if someone could get some kind of big research grant to do a longitudinal study of, let's say, 112-year-old boys in relationships with loving pedophiles. This is impossible in the United States right now. But in terms of the issue of, you know, if somebody's memories are true, that's not, that's not a helpful thing. Since you had hypnosis, I would like to give you two or three oh, I'd be glad general to. articles and then you can read them yeah. and you can make your own decisions yeah. in terms yeah. of but, uh, yeah. what you think about the reliability. Most of my memories were not under hypnosis. At some point, if physical evidence is lacking, if there is no physical evidence for something, at some point, 
many people want to just step back and say, whoa, I think I need to rethink this. I think your idea of doing a transcript of my uh, hypnosis tapes is great. That's the most objective way. I hadn't really thought about that. Well, I'm happy to speak to anybody who is really searching to find out oh, that's so good. what happened. I have another question. Yes. If I were to send you or to give you some materials, would you be willing to read them? Yeah, I'd be glad to read them. And you're open to reading skeptical oh, things. Oh, I'll read. Because, and, I absolutely. You know, and I've read a lot, actually. Yeah, and I'll read more. Yeah, I'll read whatever you um, recommend I read. Well, thank you for making the trip. Thank you for being open to questioning. Pam Fry suggested I interview FMSF board member, Dr. Lauren Pancraft. I lived in Portland at the time, which is where he lives. Hi. Hi, Mary. All I'm suggesting is maybe your memories are correct. Maybe your memories are wrong, but if they're wrong, it will take you a while to undo them, to mm -hmm. begin to unravel mm -hmm. them and to say, mm -hmm. oh, maybe they weren't quite right. Maybe mm -hmm. these were memories that are actually not true. There were things that happened to me in my mind more than it happened to me in my body. Mm -hmm. So all I'm asking is, you know, keep that idea open. Yeah, I ha and one thing I did was the whole month of December, I read only literature that was um, with the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. I could see that I was getting less defensive. And but, that's why you're making yeah. this movie. Yeah, <laughs> right. but, but one thing when I was reading that, I wanted to ask you, some of that, some of the, what I was reading, one thing was saying like, a young child who's under age two or under age three um, will never remember any abuse and if they are abused, won't be affected by it. Is that what you think? A child under two really doesn't have memories of anything that happened. Anything that doesn't, that isn't painful, the child, it wouldn't, it wouldn't hurt the child. I mean, it may be morally wrong to touch a child who's under two. It may be obnoxious. It may be, it, that's a terrible thing to do. And society says no. But if you think about it, it doesn't, it doesn't damage the child. It's, it's wrong, but the child is not damaged by it unless it's physically hurt. Physically injured or physically hurt? Physically injured or hurt, well, unless what the if, child cries. If the child cries, then would that affect the child later? So far as we know, uh, children who have been, who been physically abused, in any way abused, they don't remember that. And it doesn't seem to have any later effect on them. So that's kind of good news for my sons wanting to find babysitters for their kids because their kids are oldest is two. And so even if their kids are beat up a little bit at the babysitter, it's not going to affect them um, and unless there's an injury. And moreover, we know that most abuse of children under two, most real sexual abuse that occurs, has to do with touching, usually not penetration. It's usually not very violent. It's not violent at all. It's usually more curiosity, exploration. You think a reason someone would fondle a one-year-old is curiosity? I think that's usually what people think. So someone who would want to touch a one-year-old's vagina, does that for curiosity? Well, that would be one motivation. And a, what would they be curious about? What would an adult be curious about, about a one year I, I don't get it. That's, that's why it's deviant. Yeah, but and you think it wouldn't uncommon. hurt them? Uh, stroking the vagina of a two-year-old child, uh, 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 an unrelated male stroking a child for curiosity for any other reason. For sexual reasons for sexual and having reasons. an orgasm when the child's there would not affect the child. 
that child wouldn't remember that. For example, if the child saw, if a two-year-old child saw their parents murdered, they wouldn't remember that. That would be a terrible thing to observe for a two-year-old child, but they wouldn't remember it and therefore wouldn't be affected by it. Most mental health professionals do not agree with Dr. Pancras. I went to a child abuse conference in Salt Lake City. That's where I met Dr. Susie Wyatt, a well-respected child psychiatrist. I was told that no matter how much a child under the age of three is abused, it won't affect him because he won't remember. Wow. Um, I have to say I'm aghast hearing that. Um, do we have specific proof about memory for any of us, even good memory? No, we don't have any specific proof. But again, as a child psychiatrist, and it, what I have observed clinically, working even with really young kids, is how, how devastated they are at an emotional level when they have been exposed to any kinds of significant trauma. There's something called non-declarative memory, and um, non-declarative memory is the memory we don't have words for. But at an, a deep, um, rudimentary, guttural level, we have memory. And I would put forth that it's those people who have been so traumatized, have been so emotionally damaged at a young age who are at the most risk. I think part of what the concern is is if perpetrators hear people say doesn't necessarily hurt the kid, well, obviously there'll be more perpetrators using that as an excuse. So. Things like that should never happen to anyone. Um, but I've heard some pretty horrific things that um, humans have done to each other, which, again, just really saddens my heart. But what, um, what I know to be true and what I've seen so consistently is when people can start owning those memories, and especially that emotional content around it, and they are finally able to um, start mastering their emotions around it, that... I know that freedom is around the corner for them. And it, so I guess um, if, if there wasn't that freedom, I think it would be really overwhelming, and I don't think I could do the work that I do. But it's, it's that joy in knowing, okay, now, now they know what's going on. I love what she said. She's nothing like the counselor who tried to tell me to go find proof. She doesn't ask her clients for proof. The False Memory Syndrome Foundation recommends suing counselors like her. Who would sue a counselor who's actually doing their job correctly? Laura Pasley says her counselor convinced her of memories that weren't true. She sued her counselor and received a settlement. I read what you had posted on Bad Therapy. It was when you were 39. Yes. Okay, do you mind saying how old you are now? 60. 60, and I'm 58, so we're about the same age. Laura was 39 when she wrote, At my first counseling session, Steve, which is what she calls her counselor, asked if I'd ever been sexually abused. I told him I had when I was nine. The biggest trauma was that I couldn't tell anyone. I didn't feel comfortable. I was ashamed. So I told that to Steve right up front, but it didn't matter to him because I had always remembered. I had been sexually molested at a swimming pool. Yeah. I told, I told him that. Yeah. I said, I remember being abused. It was by a total stranger. And he just totally discounted that. He said, Do we have to go deeper. That's not it. That's not what's your problem. So, you know, when you were abused, when you were, you know, by the stranger, age nine, then did you tell your parents about it? Oh, uh -uh, no. And so, no, 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 I didn't tell anybody. So who was the first person you told? Uh, my daughter's father. Uh-huh. And, and then? That would have been in about 19, 
81, I guess, and then oh. I didn't bring it again until counseling session, and that's the only other person. Oh, so he was the second person you ever told. Yeah. I had kind of compartmentalized it. And then one oh. night, I, we were in a hotel, and I was with my doctor, you know, my boyfriend at the time, my daughter's father, and it just came flushing back all of a sudden. And, you know, I, and, I, and I told him, let's be still. My counselor said that wasn't. That wasn't it. It wasn't, it wasn't deep enough. But so that's a recovered memory if it was compartmentalized and you didn't remember it. Isn't well, that? I didn't, it didn't constantly come to mind. I hadn't, you know, I hadn't thought about it in years, but I could tell it, it actually changed some of my behavior. But it did, you know, it just kind of flushed out of me that night. But during, like, when you were a teenager and you were, like, talking to a girlfriend about, you know, no, all your secrets. Did. It, But did you remember it like other people would tell their secrets or whatever and you would remember it and just not tell, or did you just not remember it? Just didn't, didn't remember it, didn't recall it. You know, it wasn't on my forefront of my mind. Huh. You know, there again, I did, you know, when I went to counseling, I tried to tell him that that happened. And yeah. And, but that's actually a recovered memory. Why did she sue if she knows her recovered memory is true? Well, there's two different recovered memories. Laura says the memory she recovered in counseling are false, but she has a memory she considers true. She doesn't refer to it as a recovered memory, but that's what it is. She told Dr. Loftus about it, Dr. Loftus was on the board of the False Memory Syndrome Foundation, and yet they arranged for Laura to appear on talk shows and say that all recovered memories are false. Does she know that you that you were abused when you were nine and you Dr. forgot Loftus it for like an entire story? I stepped out the next month on to a media tour that was just unbelievable for about two and a half years. Wow. I, and I told at the False Memory Syndrome Foundation, I would do all of that to get the word out. Pam Fried from the False Memory Syndrome Foundation is the one who told me about Laura. Then I went back to see her a second time, and I thought, oh, I did all the things she said to do. I did all the research. So I went back, like, okay, I've done this all now, and it felt like she had no more use for me. I think she did my first interview because she thought she could convince me my memories weren't true. And that didn't happen, so she was ready for me just to leave. It is relatively easy for us to absorb certain things that we've either read or that we've seen and to incorporate them into our own stories to make them our own. It's and it, it, yeah. it's possible. And if there is a lack of concrete evidence, at some point, pe many people, some people, would either have to say, well, maybe it didn't happen, or I'm going to have to live with the ambiguity of never knowing. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that maybe that's what you'll need to do, is to just have an ambiguity that you won't find a, a final 100% answer. Yeah, I, I have, I've, I, I believe I found my answer. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I, um, I hadn't when I'd come before, but then I, I talked to you, and the questions you asked were not that different than questions I'd already asked myself. I transcribed all the hypnosis tapes. What did them. you find with those? There weren't leading questions. It sounds to me like you're quite convinced, and I don't know why you're continuing. You've found your answer, you're sure. You know, I think why I did, I realized what it was, was that this whole journey had to do with my mother. Did your mother know? I was older than 10 because it was in our new house. 
my mother always dressed elegantly for bed. And she wore shoes that are called mules. They have a hard heel. My father was in my room. It was 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night, and we didn't hear her coming down the long hallway. But when she started down the linoleum steps, I had the maid's quarters, and there were three linoleum steps. First, she very slowly went down on the first step, and then very slowly the second step. Everything stopped, and then the third step. All she had to do was take six more steps to be at my bedroom door. I knew finally, finally, it would be over. And we heard her step again, only she was going back up the steps. And I knew she would never walk through that door. Did my mother know? 13 years, my mother knew. Can I ask you, I mean, cause you believe your daughter wasn't molested. Can you tell me what process you went to determine that that was not true? Oh my goodness. Uh, one is so overwhelmed when an accusation like that comes and a very credible person that mm -hmm. I've always believed. So I withheld judgment and started to do research and in honesty, the most, in our particular case, the most telling uh, issue was the fact that she refused to talk. She refused to meet. She refused to communicate, to discuss things as, as people do. That's a lie. She didn't refuse to talk. No, she, they talked for a long time. And then it got to the point where after Pamela sent the Jane Doe article to everyone at the University of Oregon. That's when Jennifer stopped talking to her mother. Dr. Jennifer Fry chose to quit communicating with her parents after her mother, Pam Fry, sent a defamatory article to Jennifer's colleagues. And the Jane Doe article was really about Jennifer, Dr. Jennifer Fry, but it was framed as a fictional article, but it was very clearly about her, and it had all this false information. She wrote so a couple of crazy things. I thought the craziest thing she wrote was when she said, oh, when my friend suggested that I think my daughter may be jealous of me, and that's why she accused her father of incest. That is <laughs> yeah. so illogical. <laughs> it, it is. But what was really horrible is she sent it, Pam Fry, sent this partially fabricated story, but with enough truth that you would believe the whole thing, to everyone on Dr. Jennifer Fry's tenure board when she's about to be tenured. The result, though, was that Dr. Jennifer Fry is, in fact, a tenured professor at the University of Oregon. DARVO is an acronym. It stands for Deny, Attack, and Reverse Victim and Offender. Deny, Attack, Reverse Victim and Offender. DARVO describes a perpetrator strategy. And in DARVO, what happens is there is an aggressive denial followed with an attack on the credibility of the person making the claim. It might take the form of questioning their mental abilities or their motivations, saying you're a liar or you have, you're crazy. And then reverse victim and offender is when the person who's being held accountable assumes the victim role and says, I'm the victim here. And in our, more recently, we've been researching this systematically in the laboratory and we have found that unfortunately, DARVO seems to work and um, it's, you could say it's like a perpetrator strategy. And the ways we've so far found it works is it's associated with victim self-blame. So if people get DARVO'd, they're more likely to blame themselves. And it's also associated with third party judgments. So third parties who are exposed to DARVO responses versus non-DARVO responses are more likely to doubt the victim and assume the perpetrator must have some, some uh, basis for making the claims. The, the 
Good news is preliminary research in our lab also suggests that education about DARVO helps uh, mitigate a bit, that people who learn about DARVO are less likely to, um, to stop believing the victim. After over 30 years, Dr. Jennifer Fried retired from the University of Oregon. She is now at Stanford. Dr. Jennifer Fried's sister has also disclosed child sexual abuse by their father. If a corroborated case is a sibling who's always remembered, I mean, how could I get corroboration if Marilyn has a What's sibling? What's your evidence that the sister always remembered? Do you have corroboration? I do. As soon as my memories came up, I was 24. One of the first things I did was to get on planes and go talk to my sisters. My eldest sister, Gwen, who lived in Kansas City, when she knew what I was going to say, she just turned ghost white and she said, I thought I was the only one. I never should have left you. It's my fault. That would be a corroborated case. If you say so, I'll take your word for it. I'm quite hesitant because um, in my working with children, I have had children who were abused um, in class and to have an honest student who was, who under, who experienced what Marilyn claimed that she had experienced night after night and to still be so successful in school is, is difficult, but maybe she did. Do you think any honor students are incest survivors? Yes, but not night after night. Do you think the only honor students who are incest survivors were only incest I'm not, I, I don't want to try to talk about this anymore since I wasn't there. And by and large, I don't know whether somebody experienced things or not. If I have read or have reason to believe that there's an alternative explanation, uh, then I tend to go in that direction. I wrote a book, Miss America by Day, 11 years after a newspaper reporter in Denver learned that my father had come into my room from the time I was five until I was 18. It was a secret so traumatic that I had blocked it from myself that's very difficult for people to understand that you can repress 13 years of the nights of your life. But how could I remember? How could I get up and go to school every day and get A's and be in the choir and be on the ski team if I knew what I was going home to at night and there was no one to help me and there was no way to get out of there? I had to block it, which I did. Your daughter Jennifer has said publicly that about the new dancing in front of your husband, she and another little girl. And I think last time I was here, you were saying it was when she was about nine or so. Mm -hmm. Do you think your husband has sexual feelings toward her? No. Why? why? But, he's somebody that I've lived with for ever so many years. I knew him growing up. Um, I never saw any indication. But even the new dancing, I mean. He, never, it's, he didn't ask to have that. That was something that they decided to do. He didn't want them to feel traumatized by coming down too hard on them. But just to say, you know, go into your room or, I mean, did you talk to her about it later when you knew that had happened? I didn't even know about it for quite a while. Oh, she, he didn't tell you for a while after that? Well, I was working. The Falls Memory Syndrome Foundation closed its doors in 2019. What's the importance of the mother's reaction? In our midlife, we need to go back and heal the past. And I was 48 when I went to talk to my mother, and I was just sobbing uncontrollably. And when she finally knew what I was saying, and my father had been dead for a year, she said, I don't believe you. It's in your fantasy. And I thought, if my mother won't believe me when I'm 48, I certainly knew as a child, she would never 
have stood up, never. She won't even stand up for me now with my father dead. What chance would I have had as a child? I knew as a child, how do you know that? You just know it. You know that it's not, it's not safe. There's no one to tell. As we begin to talk more publicly about it, as we begin to discuss it more, it's one of the reasons I wrote Miss America by Day, is to educate so that people have a better understanding, so that someone won't say to a 35-year-old who's just beginning to have to go back and remember what happened to her, get over it. It happened, a, why are you bringing it up now? This happened 30 years ago. This is textbook. Almost all of us are between 35 and 50 when we have to go back and do the healing work. And once we understand that, once we know that that's normal, I didn't know that that was normal. I didn't know that anybody ever got through. I checked myself into a psychiatric ward. I just thought, does anyone ever get through this? I couldn't find any woman who did. And it's one of the reasons I stepped forward. It's one of the reasons I wrote a book is because yes, you can come through it. I needed my mother. I needed my mother at age 48 to say, I am so sorry to her death at age 88. She just did not choose that path. I went to my childhood home. It was brand new when we moved in. I was in first grade. My sister Ruth was in third. We thought it was huge. We played hide and seek here. We'd always been close. Ruth was the only one from my childhood I could trust. This was the last home she ever lived in. Ruth died of brain cancer at age 11. I was nine years old. Ruth Ramsey dies after illness. This is the first time I've seen this obituary. I was disinherited, but I should still get to see things like this. As is usual, the funeral home employee picked up Ruth's body at the hospital, but instead of taking it to the funeral home, he took it to our childhood church. Outside the church, before the sun came up, my parents made me watch as they cut Ruth's body with a knife. Later that day, I went to my sister's closed casket funeral. There was a ritual outside the church where they made me hold a knife, where they cut, it, cut her body. As a part of ritualistic abuse, a child may be told she is an abuser, not a victim. A child may be put in a coffin. Just relax, let it come. Yeah, it wasn't like repulsed by her body. I patted it. I put my fingers on her hair. And what I remember is touching her hair because she was still my sister. So why did your parents do that to your sister's body? There's never a way for someone who's not evil to explain an evil person's mind. But what was similar that had happened before is, this is before I started kindergarten, my dad um, killed our dog. It is not unusual for an abuser to kill a child's pet. He made me and my sister watch while he killed our dog with a knife. And he said that if you tell about the abuse, the same thing will happen to you. Yes. So then my sister dies of an illness, but she dies. And afterwards, they cut her body with a knife. And I think it was to threaten me because I know what I know happened after that was my dad started coming into my room a lot more often. Why did my parents do, the, do this to me? I'm supposed to have an answer. It's hard to believe someone would do that to anybody, you know, their child or anybody. I've, I've come to believe in my old age that some people just are evil. <laughs> just, uh, 
I never believed that when I was younger, but I'm beginning to believe it. Born evil or because of how they were treated? I don't know. I have no idea. I just can't believe people are born evil. I just think there's such purity in children. I decided to go to the cemetery and to the place where it happened to my sister's body. I made biscuits for the crew with my mother's recipe. I wrote a story about my angel connection with her. A grumpy old lady dies and becomes a cute little eight-year-old angel. I used to think of my father as an infant. I started thinking of him as a little older, four or five. That's how old he was when he was raped by a female babysitter. You know, you can't talk to an infant, but you can to a five-year-old. I had some things to say to him. So I called the minister at my childhood church and asked if he would be on camera. I told him I was molested by a church leader in addition to my father. He wanted to know the tone of the conversation and said it'd be a tone just like I'm having with you right now. I mean, I, I'm, uh, I, it's just a part of my healing. Maybe you could tell me some Bible verses that come to mind and what Christ thought or what Christ thinks about child abuse. And I'd go back and forth, what Christ thought, what Christ thinks. I, I do consider myself a Christian, but my childhood church wouldn't consider me a Christian because I, I don't have the same beliefs I did then. It was, it was a very conservative church. I was afraid when I didn't hear from him that there'd be like attorneys waiting for us there saying, you can't come on church property, but I don't. I, th I don't know how much is my fear because I mean, I was abused by church leaders, and and so it's the church leaders to, who have the decision making on whether or not I, you know, can film in the church. Um, and but the church leaders who abuse me are are deceased. The minister refused to be in the documentary, but he did give his permission for us to film on church property. I entered the place where it happened to my sister's body. glad you were my parent because I am really glad to be alive. I didn't used to be. I used to be jealous of Ruth because she died. I know you also had to see things like what you did to my sister's body. You, you saw things like that when you were a little boy. One thing I think about making this film is people are going to think you're a monster. And so I guess that's why I wanted to bring this and show that you're also this little boy. So I brought this to leave. I remember when we used to play about oh, Ruth. Oops. <laughs> it has been 50 years, 50 years since you died. I thought I'd be sad doing this today, but I'm not. You know, my life turned out good. I love you, but I don't spend a lot of time missing you. It's for you, Mom. I wish you could have had the kind of childhood you needed to give me a good childhood.
I know this won't keep it, but I want to leave it and I don't want it to get rained on right away. Everything went perfect today, but it always went right by I did just to some work. I'm gonna take your picture home. Bye, Dad. Bye, Mom. Ruth, I'll come back to see you sometime. I don't know if my parents did it to worship Satan. I just know what they did to me. And it may have just been to make child pornography. I went to a counselor a long time ago and I said, well, but you don't believe in Satan. How can you believe my memories of satanic ritual abuse? She said, I believe there are evil people who gather and, and do horrible things to children. And you know, she didn't feel like she had to believe in Satan. And that, that's where I'm at now. People used to say, uh, people like Dr. Vendercock are able to implant complex memories of satanic ritual abuse in people's minds. And I go like, wow, I wish I could do that. <laughs> I'm powerful. still struggling with the notion that I can implant, implant a, a notion in my patient's mind that I'm safe, that I'm to be trusted, and I won't rape them. And that takes me about three years to get them to be there. Yes. <laughs> you know, like, you know. So this implantation of false memories, it's, it's all nonsense. So do yeah. you think satanic ritual abuse happens to children? Sadly, it does. Sadly, it does. I know they had cameras. My dad had excellent camera equipment, especially considering that we didn't live in that nice of a house when I was real little. He used a closet as a dark room. He had professional lights. It's just so cruel and horrible. I mean, that really would be considered ritualistic what they did to my sister's body. They made me take off my panties and put hers on that were on her deceased body. I think people think that child pornography is not that, you know, people don't know what child porn really is. I mean, they think of it like you have this child who's otherwise treated well and just asked to take their clothes off and you snap a picture. That's There's a lot more. I mean, that is child pornography. Absolutely, that's child pornography but it can get a lot more involved than that. A lot of my patients, even though everything in their rational mind said, yeah, this happened to me, at the core, at the core, believe I was an evil child for believing I was abused. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and to, to really come to terms with, I was this little vulnerable kid out there right. who people did this awful stuff to, which happens all the time in our society. Yeah. And I was one of them. It's a very hard thing to accept. It is. If you work with traumatized people, you deal with these complex issues of memory. Yes. That is our field. We do that all the time. It's our bread and butter. It is what you deal with, of people who suddenly retrieve a little bit and they say, no, I must be crazy to remember this because nobody wants to remember this. Nobody wants to think that somebody who they loved mm -hmm. did this to them. So people say, no, I'm crazy. This didn't happen to me. And more and more stuff comes to mind. I said, I remember that. I said, no, I'm crazy. What's wrong with me? Let me cut myself in order to forget. Right. You know, right. that's how, what happens all the time. Right. And so when you're a clinician who does this work, that's the work you do. And so you help people to feel safe enough to allow themselves to know what they know. Yes. And that's what clinical work is about. That's a good way yeah. to say it. Feel yeah. safe enough yeah. to allow them to know what yeah. they know. But yes. nobody wants to know. The, the issue with trauma is that nobody wants to know. Yeah. Because a victim doesn't want to know. That's right. And doesn't want, want to know that their own father raped them. They don't want to know that the neighbor molested them. Particularly when you're a little kid, because a little kid is, by definition, egocentric, and no kid can say, oh, that's just a horrible person who's doing something bad to me, because the way that the child minds works is like, this is happening to me because I'm a horrible person. Mm -hmm. And so no, no kid can tolerate really yeah. putting in perspective what they know, and, 
every child who gets attacked, molested, hit, feels like I am a bad person for this happening to me. And so it becomes a shameful secret from yourself. Yes. Anybody who knows anything about trauma knows that. I had a patient who knew that her father molested her as a kid. And then she needed a babysitter. And she was so eager to believe that her father loved her and that she had a false memory that she had her father babysit her kids and her father molested her kids. Even though she had told me that her father molested her kids. We are programmed to love our parents. See, that's a yeah. thing that this whole false memory stuff doesn't yeah. get. My kids love me. Not because I was the greatest dad in the world. They just love me because mm -hmm. I'm their dad. Yes. You know? Yes. Uh, we get this love undeservedly. We get it mm -hmm. because of that's how we're formed. Mm -hmm. And what I see in my traumatized patients, they love their parents. Mm -hmm. Despite the fact that they did terrible things to them they still want to love their parents. And so when people actually come to the conclusion, my parents aren't safe, and my parents are going to hurt my kids, that takes an enormous amount of courage mm -hmm. and persistence to overcome our natural tendency to go like, the world is a wonderful place, and my parents really love me. Oh, yeah. And that struggle of really, oh, my patients are just really always struggling with it of, uh, I want to go home for Christmas. Mm -hmm. I want to be with the family. I want to be for Thanksgiving. I want to be normal. No, it didn't really happen. What happened during that interview was totally unexpected because he could tell that, he could tell something I couldn't tell about why I was doing this project. He said to me, you know, why is it that you're going around talking to these people? And I said, well, oh, it's for my project. No, it's." But he's like, he could tell there was a deeper psychological thing, and he was right. To my mind, I don't mean to be over-interpretive, but this notion of trying to find authority to validate your internal experience, it's like, oh yeah, we need to deal with that. Mm -hmm. Because by now, we need to believe in our own truth. Mm -hmm. It was after my interview with him that I thought, why have I been doing this? And that I thought, you know, no one knows that. I mean, I'm an authority on my life. And you know, that has changed my relationship with Jerry because before it would be so upsetting to me if he disagreed with me about something. And it would be upsetting because I didn't believe me enough. Yes, I can actually carry on a conversation with you and <laughs> say I disagree and you don't either start screaming or crying. <laughs> I think it was my not believing myself that kept me connected to my father. And I needed some connection. I needed some kind of connection. Oh. I am so glad to be done with the pretense of having you as a father. I just have such a good life without you. and. It's always been a life without you, but I just haven't admitted it, and now I am. When I first remembered my abuse, I questioned my memories because I didn't want them to be real. I re-examined my memories because I didn't want to spend the rest of my life believing something that was false. Am I crazy? No, I'm not. Are my memories true? Yes, I am certain of it. How have I changed? You're more confident. You're, uh, you don't get sad as much. Yeah. More healthy. People who have been traumatized live on average 10 years shorter than other people. They tend to have multiple illnesses. Why is that? Because the stress hormones that have to do with the trauma get stuck and your whole body stays in this defensive mode, fighting an unseen enemy, while your, your mind is fighting like crazy to say, no, you're crazy, this didn't happen to you, but your primitive part of your brain is not capable of these complex manipulations of your mind, and so your body feels in danger, 
and causes all these illnesses. So every piece of research on chronically traumatized people shows that they all have physical problems, they all have major problems with har hormones because the denial of what happens keeps that whole stress hormonal system running. And it's not until people can say, this is what happened to me. Oh my God, it is over. This it was real, it happened to me when I was that old. And you can say, but today I'm a grown up person and today I'm safe. And you really, in every fiber of your being, know the difference between that kid who was abused back then and who you are right now, yes. that these stress hormones come to rest yes. and you stop attacking your body. Yes. yes. Trauma 101. My chronic pain was so bad that some days I just wished I wouldn't have a long life. I mean, really, you know, I never thought about suicide, yeah. but I, it was hard for me to think of living to an old age. And now I want to live to be about a hundred years old. <laughs> <laughs> so we, as a doctor, that's a bigger story than the false memory stuff. Yeah, I can see. And the fact that you became the owner of your body. Yes. And that you regained a sense of power and agency in your body. I go like, yeah. I'm just not as afraid. Did you notice me being afraid a lot? early on. Yes. I think you were afraid of me. <laughs> you, were, yeah. you weren't sure of me, but I, I think wasn't. you're becoming more sure of me. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Just because I'm still here seven years later. Love does heal. It does. You know, it really and does. if you can open your heart to a new person and say, oh, this is what it's like to be loved. Yes. And somebody who cares about my safety. That's really so the miracle of life. And people can find their way out. It's an enormously expensive and arduous journey. It is. But I know many people like you who have made that journey yes. and come out on the other side. When I went and interviewed her, her story was so incredibly moving and all the other details of the story that I did not know that reached far back into her childhood was so overwhelming to me that I almost could not receive it. And I told her that. And I gave her so much credit because she had so much courage. And that woman is Mary Knight. This word means so much to me. When I was a kid, my abuser said, if you tell, horrible things will happen to you. I told, and I'm getting this awesome award in front of a room full of people.